for those who don't know me, I'm Jeffrey. Uh, Jeffrey Singh, S A Y. And uh, I teach at LaSalle, College of the Arts. And I, I kind of coordinate the uh, master's program in Asian art history. So if ever you are thinking of doing a uh, master's, right, I'm happy to, uh, more than happy to, to uh, you know, chat with you. Okay, so today's talk, uh, it sounds a little ambitious, right? I mean, if you look at, I mean, appreciating the art and history of painting, right? So I'm not going to tell you the whole, I don't know, how many thousand of years of painting, okay? But I'm going to focus in this talk on uh, the kind of um, seminal moments, you can call it turning points, groundbreaking, you know, moments, whatever you call it, painting, right? Uh, that has really changed the course of the, the art form itself. Breaking right. a diary is a, a, a self-reflection. What you write in the diary is a self-reflection. Right? And also, the things you write in the diary also relates to the wider life. I mean, to life itself. Right? That's what art is about. That's what artists do. I mean, you know, they, um, they, they paint uh, subjects which are personal, but at the same time, it also relates you know, to the life itself. Right? So I, I, you know, I think that that's... Uh, very good quote by uh, Tom Picasso. I don't know whether you can substitute painting with uh, sculpture to the performance art. You know? Can you say performance art is just another way of reading the diary? No? That is it's different, you see. So painting, it's specific painting. Right? Because I think painting is, a, is an art form that, uh, you know, offer many possibilities that other art forms cannot. Right? I mean, uh, firstly, the kind of vi extraordinary range of visual effects you know, that, that uh, you can provide. Uh, you know, that, that, for example, an art form that is sculpture. You know, um, you know, and, and, and there are so many other kind of uh, uh, advantages of, of painting uh, that, that you, don't, you don't kind of get in another art form, like sculpture or even photography. So I'm going to kind of focus on uh, you know, some groundbreaking moments in the art and history of painting. So the notes that you have, I've made a kind of slight amendment. So it might not run in kind of sequence. Right? There, there, there could be a couple of uh, uh, additional slides as well. First painting. So anyone wants to kind of, uh, you know, uh, offer your view as to when painting first started? When did you know, when man or a woman? Caves. Caves, the caves. Huh? Caves, yeah. Yeah, the caves. Um, yes. But, uh, yes, so, uh, we will say the prehistoric period. So, you know, so you, you find the first paintings already in the prehistoric period. But specifically, which period is it? Uh, you know, we, we can't really say for certain because there, there have been archaeological discoveries which push the origins of uh, drawing and painting you know, to, to a much earlier period. And, and it's not only in Europe now, they have found such paintings in like Indonesia, you know, in Asia itself, you know, in, in, uh, and not, not necessarily in Europe. But um, I'm going to highlight today, you know, the, the most famous, I would say, cave painting that we know of. Okay, and this is a, a quote by um, an eminent uh, French authority on prehistoric history, Jean Cortès. And uh, you know, here he's describing the moment when he came face to face right, with um, the paintings that he saw in Lascaux, which is, uh, you know, one of the most famous, if not the most famous, uh, example of cave painting in Lesco, France. I mean, the experience that I described was, uh, you know, was such a moving one that it actually moved him to tears. And, and it says, you know, um, and yes, and, and I mean, this quote itself, you know, he says that except that this great artist was unknown. Now again, whether such works can be considered. Uh, I mean, we know them as art today, but at that time, and how, you know, 
what do the people see this this uh, works as? Uh, I think that's really hard. Um, so once you when when you look at this work, okay, I think the first thing is the most striking thing is its realism and it's uh, kind of a fresh, vivid colors. Right there. When these cave paintings were first discovered, right, um, people thought that they were modern forgeries. Okay, and uh, this is uh, the, you know, um, an example from the school, paintings of bulls and horses. And um, now again, I suppose this painting, such cave paintings also um, raises the question of um, not only the origins of painting, but the function of painting. So why did early man paint or draw? Okay, so that's, that's a question, and we have no definite answer. In, in the case of uh, the cave paintings like those in Lascaux, um, it was said that, okay, the most popular theory, there are a few theories here. The most popular theory is that these paintings are mostly animals, bulls, horses, um, you know, uh, and mammals, and you know, other, other such animals, um, were associated with some kind of ritual. And one of one such ritual is what they call the, the, the hunting uh, uh, magic ritual. Okay, which they believe that whatever is depicted here on the cave floor, right? Uh, I mean, you know, they hope that whatever they depict here on the cave floor, because some of these animals have like arrows on their, their backs and all that, right? they would have a successful hunt outside. Okay, so it's uh, uh, related directly to their survival, their hunt. Okay, so it's possible. And uh, it's also possible that these animals were worshipped by the people. Right, so this, this, this is the most common theory that they have some kind of religious function. And it's not surprising because if you look at some of the early sculptures that are found in the prehistoric, they also have a religious function. Right? The Venus of Willendorf with the you know, big breasts and all that. Okay, those are pretty big figures. So it's not surprising. I don't think they want to draw for its own sake, like, you know, just draw to pass the time. Or, to decorate the walls, or, but again, you know, we, we cannot say for sure what the actual function of this thing is. I mean, if you look at them, look at this. Can we believe that you know such a painting, you know, uh, was was done what in 12,000 BC or BCE before the Roman era? Okay, that's why you know when you, this was first discovered, you know. People couldn't believe and, and you know, that they were, they were done that long ago. And it's still a range of techniques that uh, you know, we use today. Shading, outlining. Okay, so here the outline. Okay. And you know, they choose the, the surface carefully. I mean, you know, for example, they, if they want to, to uh, give more three-dimensional quality to the, to the drawing, they will choose uh, a wall with some contour, right? So they make use of the surface, the undulating wall. And then they will draw the outline and then they will fill it with colours. And the colours are of course from the earth. Right? Minerals and you know all those uh, earth, earth colours. Right? Um, right, so and they, they knew about shading, they knew about uh, perspective. Okay, uh, they knew how to use binders. At that time they used their saliva as binders. So, you know, so we, we can't, uh, it's hard to believe, right, that this was done that long ago. I'm just going to move on, kind of, you know, uh, not in any kind of sequence, you know. Uh, just going to highlight some, as I said, right, some momentous um, kind of uh, moments in life, okay, in, uh, in the history of the Okay, the first portraits. Right? When were the first portraits done? Give me an idea. Okay, I'm, I'm, I suppose here I'm referring to painted portraits. Painted portraits. And when we, we, when we say portraits, uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm, I'm referring more to uh, portraits, to pictures that capture the likeness of a person. 
So if it's just uh, capturing the idealized feature of someone, right? Okay, I, I won't kind of count that as a kind of portrait, but it must capture an individual likeness. Did the Egyptians uh, do any portraits? Right. The Mesopotamians? No, not that I know. They did sculptures of their right, kings and all that. Okay, some of which are likenesses, but not actual portraits. The Greeks painted portraits. Okay, I, I would have to say that many of, um, you know, much of Greek or uh, painting have been destroyed. So we can't say for sure whether they painted portraits of, you know, of people. Okay, but we do have uh, examples of uh, you know, uh, big sculptures, which are likenesses of people. Okay, but that, those are sculptures, uh, portraits. You know, put by Bengal. Right. Ah, portraiture. Portraiture with the thought, the soul, of the model in it. That is what I think must come. Okay, of course, uh, here Bengal is um, talking about how you know a portrait is able to capture, right, the soul of someone. Whatever you call it, the character, the personality, the psychological, you know, um, um, expression of the person. Not necessarily only the, you know, the, the, the likeness. And it's come from someone who have who have done about forty self portraits in his lifetime. Just because uh, he didn't really have enough money to afford a model. Right? That's part of the reason. Um, I won't go to, to this, I've already kind of um, gone through this, uh, you know, spoke, spoke a little bit about this. But I just want to show you this work. So, I suppose this, you can consider this to be one of the earliest, if not, you know, the earliest uh, example of the portrait. Okay, and you can uh, trace it back to the Roman period. Okay, because it is capturing the likeness of two individuals. Okay, we can safely say that that is how they look like. And uh, it is a couple, a very young couple, as you can tell from their features. Um, this portrait was found in a house in uh, Pompeii. Okay, Pompeii was one of the cities that was that were destroyed uh, by Mount Vesuvius in 72. C around there, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. And, but ironically, the volcanic ash helped to preserve the houses and the things inside the house, like these paintings. Um, so, okay, so this painting was found in, uh, in a house in Pompeii. And if you look at it, what again? What's the function of such portraits? Okay, it's a, it's a painting portrait of a couple. Okay, probably recently married. Um, they carry a few objects. She carries a stylus. Um, he carries a scroll, and there's also a tablet there. Okay, so these are like uh, objects associated with writing. We suggest that they are someone highly educated, not necessarily. Okay, they could be illiterate as well. But those are the kind of objects that uh, you know. It's like the, our, our wedding portrait today. Right? They make you carry certain certain things, and it's the same thing. Okay, uh, you know, wedding portraits will have a couple carry you know, such uh, you know, instruments or objects. So they serve the same function as today's, I suppose, wedding portraits. It is a wedding portrait. Okay, to commemorate their, their wedding. Okay, and, uh, and if you look at her, she looks a bit awkward looking away from us, you know, but he needs our gaze, but yeah, and in all likelihood is uh, is, is a, a real likeness of of, the, of this couple who lived back then. But what happened to them? Unfortunately, they were been buried okay, under the volcanic ash, immortalized forever. It, this is a fresco, meaning to say uh, it's a, a pigment painted on wet plaster. So I, I suppose that also uh, is the reason why you know these paintings were you know were, were, were preserved. 
self-portraits. Now when they sell portraits, first, yeah. It was during the Renaissance. Now why? Okay, a couple of reasons. Okay, in the Renaissance, you have the revival of what we call um, humanism. Okay, humanism is, a, is, is related to humanist philosophy, where, you know, again, um, there's a lot of emphasis in place on the individual, right? on individual achievement, on individual fame. Um, okay, so, so that also led to the rise or the emergence of self-portraits. Secondly, we have the, what we call, the professionalization of the artists during the Renaissance. The artists uh, became known as, uh, you know, they, they were not, um, they were no longer mere craftsmen or artisans. They were, they were artists, professional artists. So we need to say that um, there was a rise in the, the status, you know, of artists at that time. And so these self-portraits are kind of, um, a, a reflection of that kind of self-assurance and confidence right, of artists during the Renaissance. So you see self-portraits beginning to emerge during the Renaissance. Um, particularly, I think, in the North. Not so much in, well, in Italy, yes, you do. I mean, we, we have self-portraits of uh, Leonardo, right? Okay, and, and some of the other Renaissance artists. But uh, it is Dura, Albert Dura, Okay, who at that time made the most self-portraits, although it was like only three to four, I believe, self-portraits, but you know, still, um, you know, at that time it was it's considered quite, quite a lot. And this is his most famous. Who does it, I mean, who does this portrait remind you of? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. And such, uh, you know, we call it a hierarchic portrait, meaning to say, he is supposed uh, frontally. The front end. Such portraits, you know, frontal portraits were actually only reserved for you know, um, uh, you know, um, so-called images of Jesus that you find in the, in the Byzantine period. Right, which uh, have led people to believe that here, Dura wanted people to see him as uh, some sort of uh, Christ. Okay. Um, you know, and uh, you know there, there's a there's a work written at that time by Thomas Kempis called the, uh, uh, the Imitation of Christ. Okay, which uh, of course you know that that is uh, to ask people to, to follow the example of Christ and to preach the values of humility, austerity, uh, you know, and, and such values. But do we see it here? Of course not. <laughs> I mean, look at look at Dura. So you know he's conscious of his uh, fashionable good looks. And, you know, right? <laughs> Um, you know, and, and, and his, his fashionable, you know, lots of hair, fur lined coat. Okay, far from the kind of values that Thomas Campus actually, you know, preached. Okay, and another thing, and, and so it led also some people to, to, to think that uh, he probably want to style himself after the creator God. So the artist, he is actually a creator. So he's like a creator God. So there are all these possibilities you now when we interpret this painting. And now and he also, you know, he has a very interesting signature here. A monogram, an A and then a D inside. Okay, Albrecht Dura. And then uh, there's a description there, right? He's uh, age 28 years old. So um that's Dura. Now, before I go further, I need to point this out. Um, now, beginning in about the 17th, the 18th centuries, with the rise of the academies, art academies, art academies first um, kind of were set up in uh, France and then also in England. And especially the, the academy in France. Now, these academies, they, um, they, they value certain genres of painting. Right? And the, the noblest of this so-called genres okay, is what we call history painting. Now, history painting also includes like paintings of religion, mythology, and of course history. That's on the top. So they, they actually came up with a hierarchy. Okay, so history painting is always at the top. Okay, then followed by portraiture. So certain artists they will shun like uh, 
doing portraiture because they thought that you know um, they won't get the kind of recognition that you know that a history painting will, will, will bring. Okay, and then um, genre. Now we have this uh, the third one is genre. Genre is actually painting of everyday life. Okay, so for example, the paintings of Vermeer, young Vermeer, you know, showing Vermeer paint, pouring milk, and you know, all that. Okay, that's considered a genre painting. Okay, and then landscape. Animal painting and still life is right at the bottom. Okay? Because to paint still life, you don't need any knowledge, right? You just need those objects in front of you, right? But for history painting, you need a good knowledge of history, of mythology, and you know. So you need some intellectual capacity to do history painting. And that's an example of history painting by David, Jacques David. And they're normally quite large, right? Okay, over two meters. Okay, that's another uh, kind of uh, you know, quality of uh, history painting. Okay, David's history, and they must also tell. Um, they, they must also have a you know have a certain moral story. To tell. Okay, that, that's why you know history painting is also so valuable. And David's painting, for example, if you look at that, both of the Borati, okay, is all about patriotism and loyalty. It's about these uh, three brothers swearing to their father, um, you know, as they went out to fight the rival family. Okay, and this painting was done at the time of the French Revolution. Okay, it's about patriotism, it's about loyalty. Okay, um, one. first news. Now, when, uh, you know, uh, okay, when did the first news appear? Anyone wants to kind of um, like uh, educated, uh, or if you, have, you, know, you might have some answers, you know, that you know, kind of you know, Now again, it depends on what you consider new. Okay. I mean, new here, okay, you say literally it's without, you know, any clothing, any clothes. Um, who invented the first news? It's a Greeks. Okay, but the first news actually appeared in uh, well, the Greeks had news actually in paint, both painting and sculpture. Okay, but of course, their their, their news uh, are most uh, famously depicted in the form of sculptures. Right, uh, you have this uh, sculptor called uh, uh, Phidias. Or Praxiteles, right? The one who did the new figure of Venus. But if you look at the vast painting, their vast paintings are full of naked figures, right? If you look at the vast painting, the, the kind of the erotic ones where you know it shows uh, you know artistic scenes and all that, right? Those are considered to be um, new paintings also. Okay, so it was during the Greek period that new paintings already first right appeared. The new is exquisite, the most beautiful thing in the world. Right? And uh, you know, somehow you know, artists are always fascinated by the you know the, the human body. Um, especially Western art. Okay, but in the East, in Asia, okay, the new is of uh, little importance. Okay, except uh, perhaps with the exception of India. If you look at, for example, the you know, I mean, in India, right? There's a celebration of the human body, okay, uh, especially the female figure. Okay, and um, and in the West, it's also a building block of art, and you know, artists would learn by you know through life drawing. Okay, for example, which still goes on today, the tradition of life drawing. But the kind of new that we are talking about here, right, uh, is what we call the new that has been established in Western art since um, the Renaissance. Right? Since the Renaissance. It's a kind of what we call the reclining new. Okay, the reclining new. So the reclining new first started, uh, or first emerged really in the in about the 15th century. But just to let you know that before the Renaissance, in the medieval period. In about a thousand years after the fall of Rome, right? um, you know, new bodies 
in in uh, in art were were actually forbidden. The only two people who who's, uh, who are allowed to be shown uh, nude, right? Do you know who? Okay. Adam and Eve. <laughs> Adam and Eve. Um, yeah. So, right. so the nude again started to be really much in the Renaissance, and what you see here, um, you know, is. Uh, I would say perhaps the first reclining nude painting by Giorgioni. Giorgioni uh, is a Venetian painter, or was a Venetian painter, and uh, of course his most famous pupil is uh, was Titian, E I P I A N. So reclining nude, right? You see, uh, you know, a, 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 a nude female figure reclining. Um, now here this is a rather uh, rather unusual reclining meal because here um, Giorgioni situates her outdoors within a landscape. So she becomes part of nature. Okay so I suppose here the artist wants to relate the human body to nature itself. Right? The curves, the contours of the body follow you know the, the contours of the landscape, right? The hills in the distance. And, um, and I would say when you talk about new paintings, okay, we cannot avoid talking about um, this whole issue about uh, or, or this question about eroticism. Does it look erotic to you? Okay. Huh? No, what? Huh? <laughs> I don't know, you know, it depends on <laughs> it is an erotic painting. Okay, it is sensual. I would I wouldn't call it pornography, okay? um, maybe erotic, uh, and and such uh, paintings as I would say model itself, especially the reclining nude, after the kinds of um, nude sculptures that you find in Greece, okay, the kind of modest Venus sculptures where um, the figure would have uh, one of her hands covering a groin area, okay, a, a kind of a, a private parts, as a sign of. Um, Kind of uh, modesty, but actually, when you cover your private part, you are actually drawing our attention. That so it's, it's both modesty and, and both erotic as well. And here, the eroticism is uh, reinforced by, um, you know, um, the, the figure here raising a, a right hand, thus exposing a breast even more. Okay? And reinforced again by the velvet, the, the, the red kind of a velvet sheets, and also the silvery sheets that she's lying on. Okay, all those kind of reinforce the, you know, the erotic quality of this painting. Um, okay, and the fact that you know, not all nudes have their eyes closed. Not all reclining nudes, but this one has her eyes closed. Again, that is a, you know, reinforces the erotic scene because it makes all of us a voyeur. Okay? Because she's not aware that you're looking at her. It all depends. Sometimes you have a client looking directly at you. That's also quite important, you know, making your gaze. But here, you know, the eyes are closed and it makes all of us kind of, you know, a voyeur when you look at her. He said that this painting was unfinished and uh, uh, Titian actually completed it, right? For example, the sky. And, you know, some people have issues with uh, new paintings like the Domina Girls, you know. <laughs> the Gorilla Girls are this uh, group of, uh, I'll call them performance artists, activists, okay? Right? Uh, you know, activists. Nobody really knows who they, they are, they are, because they don not gorilla mask, okay? And they employ gorilla tactics. They go out, okay? they would uh, distribute posters, stickers, in public uh, places, drawing attention to, um, you know, uh, uh, racism and sexism, especially in the art world. So this is one of their most famous work, and uh, it says the women have to be naked to get to the <laughs> Metropolitan Museum. Right? So less than five percent of the artists in the modern art section are women, but eighty-five percent of the nudes are female. <laughs> and I believe today uh, little has changed. I suppose. Yeah, I don't think uh, much has changed yet. So there's this whole discourse about uh, the, the the nude in art, you know, especially the female nude. Okay, about uh, whether um, you know about, about this whole thing about like 
the nudes are were painted for the male gaze. Okay, by male artists. Okay, for male audience. Right? So this whole discourse about, right, about the female nude. You know, from a feminist perspective. Right? Okay, um, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about innovations in painting. First, all paintings. Everyone knows when uh, Now the first oil paintings, um, uh, well, they were, were you know, they, they, were, they were actually traced back to uh, about as early as the fifth, right, um, between the fifth and the tenth centuries uh, uh, CE, right, and they found uh, you know uh, works using using oil in, uh, for example, in cave, uh, in certain caves in Afghanistan, right, cave paintings. Afghanistan. And, um, and I think in Europe, uh, all, all paintings uh, first started to appear perhaps in the 11th or 12th century. Right? But uh, I mean, but really, I mean, it was only later on, a few centuries later, that you know we have the uh, artists who began to, to, to have a mastery okay, of oil painting. Um, A quote by Giorgio Vasari. He's a biographer of Renaissance artists. Um, he wrote this book called Lives of the Artists, right, which are really bi biographies of artists' lives. And he says, the oil technique was the most wonderful invention and a great improvement in the art. Painting. Definitely. Right, definitely. I mean, for those who pay, you know the advantages of oil painting over even acrylic or even over this uh, very traditional medium called tempura. Sorry, not tempura. <laughs> you know, I came across an article, right, okay, uh, about art in the space time, written by someone quite, uh, uh, you know, uh, established. You know? And the word tempura was mentioned three times. <laughs> in the straits times, right? But that was some time back. Okay, so, you know, tempura is a pigment mixed with uh, egg yolk. White. And tempera was the most popular kind of medium, uh, you know, before the invention of oil. Um, but you know, as I said, oil has so many advantages over other medium. Uh, you know, uh, with oil you can, you know, it is slow drying, so you can actually paint, you know, right slowly, and you know, uh, uh, you know, if you, you make. Uh, Kind of mistakes you can correct it. Right? It gives you a kind of um, luminosity right, that other mediums cannot give. Right? So, so you can uh, achieve you know, even contrasting effects like light and dark. Okay, well, we'll be talking about that in a while. You can achieve uh, what you call dual light qualities. Right? Um, you know, that that uh, you know, a medium like tempera right, cannot achieve. Okay, so, um, so it affords the you know it afforded artists so many advantages over you know other medium. That's why some of the most uh, famous paintings we know they were done using oil. Of course today you know, things have changed and you know you have the, the invention of uh, other mediums like acrylic and all that. Okay and. It was actually first in, uh, in, in, in the Netherlands and in this place called Flanders. Flanders is today modern day Belgium. Right? It was in the north again, right? rather than in Italian, uh, in Italy, right? in, the, in, the, in the north during the Renaissance, that artists first began to not only exploit, but I would say even to master this medium of oil. And again, you know. Uh, through the use of uh, lasers, which are transparent or semi-transparent, kind of you know, uh, uh, oil, you can achieve that kind of uh, luminous or luminosity uh, that uh, you, know, uh, you cannot achieve with other medium. Um, so, by the 16th century, tempera already had been largely superseded by the use of oil, and as I mentioned, you can achieve that kind of naturalistic effects. The meticulous details 
面有啊，即係個快打啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你先攞啲嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢啊！你唔使翻嘢And and again, you know, now again another advantage of using all is that you can achieve that kind of textural variations, okay, that you can see here, okay, the you know to you know the depiction of uh, tactile effects, textural effects, right? It's quite clear, you know, with uh, you know through the use of oil paint. It is a famous work by Jan van Eyck. There's so much to, to say about it. I mean, I can spend a whole world lecture really talking about this work. Okay, um, some have disputed, uh, where, you know, uh, or, or have a kind of uh, disputed the claim that you know, it is a wedding uh, taking place. Okay, so if you go to the National Gallery, they will just have this caption. The Amofini double portrait, without saying that it is a wedding. Okay? But it depicts uh, two Italian migrants, Giovanni and Giovanna, okay, they're holding hands, right? And you can see that uh, it's all taking place in a luxurious setting. Okay, um, and you know, uh, some historians, especially this historic, German historian called Panofsky, right, have, um, in the, you know, when you look at this painting, you know, he, he said that um, this painting itself uh, is probably, um, you know, it's a sacred wedding taking place because all the objects you see. Now, the thing with Flemish painting is this, that many of the common household objects you see there, they are actually dis disguised. Okay, they are actually, uh, you know, uh, they have religious symbolism. Okay, so, so they have, so they are, but they are disguised as everyday objects, you know, like the candle, right? Uh, there's a single lighted candle there that probably stands for the presence of, of Christ or the incarnation of Christ. Okay, the dog there stands for fidelity, marital fidelity. So I would say that whatever the interpretation is, there are many interpretations. You can have a feminist interpretation, a Marxist one, and all that. Okay, but one thing is clear is that a lot of the objects here relate to um, marriage. It relates to fidelity. If you look at this um, this chair here, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, if you look at this chair there. Um, it has a statue of Saint Margaret. Now, what would one have a statue of Saint Margaret? Who is actually the patron of childbirth? Okay. So many of the, as I said, the, the objects there, you know, relate. And look at the the the, the so-called bride, you know, or, or rather the partner. I mean, you know, you can't say for sure it's a wedding, right? She really pregnant. She is. <laughs> um. You know, unlikely because uh, it's really taboo, uh, right? You can't really uh, be, you know, um, expecting or be pregnant before you actually marry. Okay. Uh, so, you know, it is. You know, she's holding the excess of a gown again okay, to to show that uh, she's actually, uh, you know, uh, bearing a child, but she's not. It's only a kind of um, expectation, right, of a future role as a mother. So all these again relate to fertility. Right? So this entire painting right, okay, has a theme of marriage and fertility. Okay, but go and look at the painting again. I mean it's amazing, the details are you know, and, and it's only through oil paint that you could, you could achieve this so-called meticulous jewel-like details. I mean my family's um, critics look at this painting, they look at it another way. So that's also interesting about artistry. You can interpret a painting using different kind of perspective. Right? You'll look at, well, you know, you know, women are only meant to bear children, you know, right? That's the rule of women, yeah? Things like that. So, you know, it became critical of, of the painting and all that. And you know, and even the man, you know, uh, relation relation to the woman here in terms of his or, you know, of his pose and all that, um, you know, assumes a kind of superiority. Okay, but I won't go into all those kinds of uh, you know arguments here. Okay, so 
Okay, the other one, uh, uh, very important innovation is the use of perspective in painting. Okay, the use of perspective. Um, okay, when did, uh, when was perspective first used uh, in painting? Again, we trace the use of perspective to the Roman period. Again, these are paintings found in houses in Pompeii or in Herculaneum, one of the you know cities uh, you know destroyed by you know the volcano by Mount Vesuvius. And such paintings were quite uh, were not uncommon. These are like vistas, okay, vistas, okay, uh, making you see you know the, the, you know um, it's a scene. A scene of a, a distant kind of, uh, you know, here uh, a building or, or you know, landscape, right? And um, so here already we, we, we see the use of some perspective. Okay. And so we know that the Romans knew about perspective, right? Um, the Greeks, because they were such great mathematicians, they probably knew about perspective. Okay, although they didn't quite, but as I said. You know, most of Greek paintings have been destroyed, except those on the Greek buses, right? So we don't know whether they actually employed perspective in their art. But the use, the first use of sign, okay, before that, I have, I have a lot of quotes in here. <laughs> this is a quote by Leonardo. In perspective is to painting what? The bridle is the horse, the rudder to a ship. Meaning to say that perspective is so essential in painting. Unfortunately, not many artists use perspective anymore because it's really painstaking. Because you have to do perspectival studies and all that. Right? Uh, you know, it's time consuming. Um, but during the Renaissance, you know, this is, uh, you know, I mean, a lot of artists sort of heeded what, you know, Leonardo said is perspective is essential to, to painting. And that's what made Renaissance uh, work so appreciated even today. And you know, and, and there's always that kind of wow factor, you know, when we look at Renaissance painting. You know, how can it be so good? And it's because of the study of perspective and the application of perspective in the work, in the paintings. And what actually is perspective? I think I don't really have the I think you have an idea of what perspective is. It's like rep the representation of a three-dimensional world. Okay, whether it's objects or figures, houses, buildings, on a two-dimensional surface. Now, how do you even achieve that? Okay, so it's to make something appear um, real. Okay, of course, that reality is only an illusion. Okay, so it's to convey the illusion of reality. In other words, to make distant objects seem smaller than closer ones. I'll, I'll talk more about that when we want. Now, who invented perspective? Right, it was said to be this um, Renaissance artist. He's more than an artist, he's an architect, an artist. Um, and his name uh, is Filippo Brunelleschi. And, the top, and this was the, perhaps the first time that, uh, you know, uh, artists, right, or, or you know, or, you know, manage to kind of use a mathematical way to calculate space. Right. So he came up with a device, okay, a device using, a, you know, um, what you call perspectival lines. Okay, because um, Brunelleschi believed that um, if you stand from a fixed point, you look at something, you know, if you look at a long road, all right, you know the lines will converge into the distance. And then you reach a certain point. That point is called the vanishing point. Right. Okay, so um, he said that by following this uh, kind of uh, uh, system of perspective, okay, you can actually create uh, realistic drawings. Okay, so on the right, you see here um, how perspec perspective lines can be applied to the, you know, the drawing of uh, the Florence tapestry. That was actually his experiment. He's standing in front of the Florence Baptist Street. 
Okay, before that, he did a pers perspectively uh, kind of uh, accurate painting of the Florence Baptistry here. Okay, and then holding the back of uh, of, the, of the painting towards him, he then uh, has a mirror. Sorry, the painting is done here, right? This is the painting. Okay, and then he bore a hole through the painting, and then he carries a mirror. He also bore a hole through here. So through the hole. He can see the kind of uh, he can see the actual how the lines converge to the actual building. Right. Okay, and then through the uh, reflection of the mirror, he could see the, the drawing being reflected. And then when he takes the mirror off, he can see the actual building in front of him. And pulling the mirror back, right, he can see the you know the, the drawing. So um, in, in that way, you could see how accurate, right, is drawing of that building is. Okay? How, how well coordinated the lines are. And all that. Okay, so this was the experiment that you know really uh, uh, signaled the, the kind of the birth of uh, what we call one point or linear perspective. Okay, Bruno Lesky's experiment. You see artists taking a different direction. Right? Um, in fact uh, uh, they took new approaches to resolving artistic problems. Okay, and that problems re relate to representation. So if I can, I can do a better job with a camera, taking a shot of a tree. Why do I need to paint a tree? There's no point. Okay, so you see here, you know, artists uh, uh, moving away more and more from, uh, you know, uh, representing an object or a figure in a realistic way. And artists beginning to move more towards abstraction. Right. Beginning first with impressions. Although the impressions really never departed from, from the subject, but it started with impressions. But for the impressions as well, um, you know, the camera was never a threat to, to you know, their role as painters. In fact, they actually used the camera to aid in their own work. Now this is a, a 19th century snapshot. Now you will find you know, the oddities, the kind of compositional oddities of such photographs. Okay, what sort of oddities? Unusual juxtaposition, you know, accidental effects, cropping off along, you know, on the edges. Okay, those are the oddities. And these oddities were, um, in a sense, uh, repeated. Right, or copied even in Impressionist works. Okay, and many of the Impressionist painters actually own cameras. Right? And in fact, they are actually use the camera to, to help him in his uh, uh, studies of, um, you know, of, of his paintings. Right? And he's most famous for his uh, um, paintings of ballerinas right? uh, at rehearsals. Can you see the, the similarity between this and the previous one? Definitely. The asymmetry, right, the cropping off again uh, along the edges of the painting, right, the, the kind of spontaneity and accidental effect. Okay, so, you know, so artists began to incorporate such photographic qualities in their work, and we see that in the work of many, uh, Monet, rather. Take up morning. Right. If you look on the left, right, um, now the left one is a photograph taken in 1867, and it shows you figures, but the figures are blurred. Okay, that's because uh, cameras at the time had very slow shutter speed. Okay. <laughs> so it's slow shutter speed. Okay, the figures appear blurred. Right. So look at morning. How he tried to mimic that kind of you know blurriness in his own painting. But of course, you know, the, I mean, that's his style as well, right? I mean, he wouldn't, you know, his style is always very sketchy and, you know, very impressionistic. Okay, but one wouldn't discount the fact that he was influenced by the camera, by the photograph. And we go up, up all the way to the 1970s and 1980s. Okay, where you have this movement called um, photorealism. And 
you know, it, it's easy to understand why the movement was, was called photorealism. Because they produce photorealistic works. They, they're, they're also known as, uh, this movement is also known as hyperrealism. And uh, of course, you have people like famous artists like Chuck Close, who's considered to be the leader of the movement. Okay, and then uh, Audrey Flack, and then the sculpture, you know, right? You have Dwayne Hanson, who created those sculptures that people mistake for real people. Okay, Dwayne Hanson. And then Richard Estes, an American artist, okay, who is uh, famous for his, uh, this is, by the way, a painting. It's part of campus, based on photographs. Okay, so the photorealist painters, um, you know, artists actually painted their works, right, based on photographs. Their techniques vary, right? So somebody, uh, Chuck Close would project the photographs onto his canvas, but here, Estes, in terms of his working method, he would, um, to paint a scene, he would take many photographs, dozens of photographs of, you know, a particular scene, you know. And then what he would do is that he would take two or three of these photographs, combine them into a single Painting. So although his uh, paintings look like an actual place, it's not. It's not. Okay, you might think that you have you you have crossed this street somewhere, but when you look at it again, you know, right? This place doesn't. It might seem familiar, but yet it's not. Okay, and his paintings are quite haunting as well because it's devoid of people, you know, and and he likes to play with reflection. So there's a lot of things that can say about this painting. Okay, you look at this painting, it's really two halves. And the one is the reflected half, the other is the actual right, kind of uh, scene here. So often it's been uh, compared to Claude Monet, you know, because Monet also was really interested in painting uh, reflection, especially for his uh, Water Lily series. Okay, so you see artists like Richard Estes, okay, uh, you know, using the photograph as a tool right, uh, for his painting. Okay, but of course you have uh, artists like John Baldessari, who is an uh, American um, artist who famously in 1970, right, he burned, he incinerated most of his paintings because he found uh, you know, photography to be more useful. Right? <laughs> okay, that was in 1970. So you have artists like that. So, you know, um, but we well, well, revisit this question again whether you know, uh, painting is actually great. Maybe I want to get your views on that. Okay, I need to move on now. Uh, first painting to break with tradition. Okay, and uh, really the first painting we really broke with tradition was not really Picasso. It was Adam Manning. And this is a quote by Emil Zola, who was an editor and a champion of the Impressionists, a supporter of the Impressionists. Um, and his uh, quote, it's, it's really you know something to to, to uh, something very relevant. Okay, because in this quote he said that Mendy was no longer concerned with the subject. Okay? He was concerned not with what to paint, okay? but how to paint. That's the difference now. Okay, so artists and again one can attribute that to the invention of the camera. Okay? So now artists began to focus only on techniques. Processes. The painting is just that. It's you know um, a flat kind of surface made up of painted shapes. That's it. Right? Okay, so artists now began to break away from the Renaissance tradition from perspective. The picture is getting more and more flat. Right? Flatter and flatter. Okay, so uh, you know, until you you, you 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 know you reach the you know I mean it was Cezanne who really kind of uh, you know uh, puts everything really on the picture plane itself on the surface. Okay, and then later on you have Picasso who really um, uh, once and for all broke away from you know the Renaissance traditional perspective. Okay, we'll come to Picasso right um, in a while. 